When I was a young boy, for three straight summers, probably the summers before my third, fourth, and fifth grade, something in that time frame, my brother and I went to spend the summer on the Vansel family farm. We'd spend uh, about six weeks living with my aunt and uncle and helping on the farm that their family was a part of. I use that term helping very liberally and very generously for two uh, city kids coming to help on the farm. I'm not sure how much help we really were, but we had a lot of fun being there and being a part of that process. We would always get there right before harvesting the grain. And so we would get there in time to see the uh, combines go out in the field and, and run through the wheat fields and, and the other grains. And uh, I remember enjoying that process, watching the com combine go through and cut those things down and pull the grain out and then leave the stalks in the field. Because after that, we also would be a part of the baling season. It was hot, grimy, gritty, uh, tough work, but I loved it. I loved doing it because it felt manly. It felt like I was strong to be able to be a part of that process, grabbing grabbing those bales as they came off the conveyor with that hook and then stacking them on the wagon as we went through the field. Uh, and then also we would get a chance to drive the tractor back to the barn with three or four full uh, wagons behind it, driving through the field along these country lanes and then back to the, uh, uh, to the barn where we were gonna store them. And, and that was so cool, driving a tractor. How many of my friends could say they did that? Well, another thing that really impressed me was that as we would be doing this, as we'd be going through these fields, we would see these millions upon millions of one to two inch little stalks all through the field. And we knew that those had been stalks for the wheat or whatever it was that we had just uh, helped process there. Um, it was amazing to me how much was produced from those seeds that had just been planted a few weeks ago, a, few, a couple months ago. And uh, it was amazing how much came out of that field from those little seeds. Well, we're going to look at a similar thing today. We're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 13. If you have your Bible, I'd ask you to grab it and turn to Matthew 13 so we can uh, read this together. Today we start a new series on kingdom parables where Jesus is going to tell us what the kingdom of God is like and how God builds the kingdom through these stories. We're going to see how people respond to the message about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, remember that the overall message of Matthew is about Jesus coming as the king and bringing this kingdom, this kingdom of heaven that people knew about, but probably had all kinds of wrong ideas about and they needed correction. And so Matthew writes to tell us what the real king and the real kingdom were like uh, through stories. These uh, parables are about what will happen, yes. It's about the process of the coming years of the building of the kingdom, but it's also about what has just happened right here in the book of Matthew, and I'm hoping to show you that as we go through it. So if you'll uh, stand with me wherever you're at, if you're able, uh, we're gonna read God's authoritative, inerrant, infallible word to us today. Matthew 13, verse one. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up and the the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's jump to verse 18. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. What was sown on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. 
When trouble or persecution comes because of the world, he quickly falls away. What was sown among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out, making it unfruitful. But what was sown in good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So you can sit down. That was God's words and thoughts for us today. In this passage, we get several different kinds of soil that seed falls upon. These represent different message hearers, different kinds of hearts, different kinds of souls that hear the message of salvation, that hear about the kingdom of God and what it represents. We get the hard hearts where the message never penetrates. It's easily forgotten or brushed aside. We get those seemingly receptive hearts where some kind of belief takes place quickly, but distractions, the troubles in life, maybe the old life comes to distract and and take us away from uh, from those truths that are bearing fruit in our lives. And those are represented by those first soils. I see a three-part process here that must take place for the kingdom of God to grow, for the kingdom to grow in us and in the world around us. So I'm gonna look at those three things. I also see a parallel in the layout of the book of Matthew. As, it, as Matthew goes through and shows Jesus bringing the kingdom, I see these three phases uh, in the book of Matthew as well. I'm hoping to show you that as we go through. So we start with phase one, the seed is prepared. Uh, the soil is prepared, I'm sorry. You gotta prepare that soil. You've gotta till it, you've gotta plow it, you've gotta open it up. You gotta make it available for the seed to fall into. You gotta bring the nutrients up and uh, expose them to the seed. You also have to have the sun and the air and the rainwater interact with the soil to create just the perfect environment for the seed to produce something in. Well, we see that happening in the book of Matthew. We don't see it in the parable. We start with the, with the farmer sowing seed in a field that's already been prepared. And so although Jesus doesn't talk about the farmer going out and plowing this field and getting it ready, we know that it must have already been plowed and made ready for this farmer to go and sow this seed. But in Matthew, he starts right away in the very first verse with Jesus being the son of Abraham and the son of David, the two most important genealogies in the life of any Jew. To be the son of Abraham meant you were a part of the nation of Israel, and you had some validity among other Jews. And then to say he was the son of David harkens back to that great king and this kingdom that was thriving, that all Jews look back upon with pride. That's what they strive for. That's what they hope for in the future, that they could someday return to that great kingdom. And here is a man who claims that Jesus was a part of that royal line. It's like a slap in the face right there in the first chapter. Wake up. We get the genealogy. We get Jesus' birth. And then we get two expressions, um, positive and negative, but we get two expressions that prove his royalty. One is a secular king who's afraid of his birth and wants to kill him because he feels threatened. Why? Because of Jesus' royalty. And then we have wise men traveling from uh, far in the east coming to acknowledge that a king has been born and they give gifts in line with a king. And so we have these proofs that Jesus is someone special right here in the book of Matthew. And we have John the Baptist showing up and walking around preparing the way for the Messiah, preparing the way of the Lord, plowing fields, plowing people's hearts, getting them ready. We have Jesus walking around saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. I'm bringing it, getting people ready so that when he begins to explain it, they'll be ready to hear it. We see him picking disciples and preaching and doing miracles to get people's attention so that when he says something, they'll be paying attention, plowing the souls and the hearts of the people that he's going to preach to. Well, that's Matthew 1 through 4, the preparation period, the soil preparation period as Matthew lays it out in the first four chapters. Again, we don't see that in the parable, but we know that that happens before the farmer goes out to sow the seed 
and we see it happening in the book of Matthew. Well, then we go to phase two. After the field is plowed, you can't just hope something grows in it. You've got to plant the seeds. Now, in modern-day farming, we see even lines of, we see even rows of uh, grain, corn, other things that have been planted because the way modern farmers do it is they plow it and then they go out with a seed planter towed behind a tractor and it goes where it's been plowed. So the farmer knows, I plowed over here, I'm going to take the planter over here. Those seeds are going to go into the soil that's been prepared. You're not going to see soil thrown up onto the road. You're not going to see it thrown into the rocks or into these weeds and thistles over here because the farmer knows he didn't plow over there. He's not going to drag that seed planter over into that area. But what happened in ancient times is a farmer would go out into the field with a sack full of seeds or a basket or uh, some sort of pouch that would be full of seeds, and he would go stand in his field. He didn't want to walk around too much because you don't want to stomp down the ground and make it hard. He'd find a place to stand where he could reach in and grab some seed, and then he'd throw it out and try and plant the seed that way, and he'd be flinging it out to all different places in his field, trying to get into the corners and along the edges. And as he would do that, seed would go too far, and it would land on the path where people were walking over there, or it would land uh, in those rocks that were separating his field from the next field, or in this part that he was unable to plow before and where there were weeds and thistles growing. So in, an ancient, uh, in ancient times, this audience would have understood those different kinds of soils, and we need to understand that as well as we approach this. How does Matthew present this in his gospel? Well, again, we talks about the first four chapters being soil preparation, and then the next eight are about planting seeds. And so uh, Jesus begins chapter five of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he talks about the Beatitudes. He, he gives us the character qualities of the kingdom and the citizens of the kingdom. He begins to unfold what the kingdom looks like, what the values of the kingdom are, what the goals of the kingdom are, how its citizens, those who are part of the kingdom, should act, what they should expect, how they should treat other people. What is expected of the king, the kingdom, and its citizens? And he lays all that out uh, in those three chapters. And then we see him planting seeds in different kinds of lives as he go through those chapters as well. He's planting seeds in the disciples' lives. They watch him going around, teaching and preaching, healing people, the way he treats people, how it's in line with what he's been preaching. All these are seeds that are being sown into the disciples' lives. He's also sowing seeds into the lives of the people that are out there, the general populace of the area. They're the objects of his miracles, and many of them are a part of his teaching. Remember, at the beginning of this chapter, it said the crowd was so large, so we know it wasn't just the 12 disciples. The crowd was so large, he had to get in a boat so that he could actually speak to them. So there's a lot of people gathering around Jesus, hearing about this kingdom that Jesus came. The Pharisees and other religious leaders are having seeds sown into their lives as well. And we see how they respond. Even John the Baptist has seeds sown into his life. He is helping plow the field. He's a major character. And Jesus acknowledges the value of John the Baptist in the ministry of this new kingdom. But John needs reassurance that what he's done, the work that he's done to prepare these people is not in vain. So let's look at some of these. We, we have Jesus warning these cities where, where Jesus has been performing these miracles. What kind of soil was that? Well, those, again, the, the general population that has been seeing these miracles and hearing the teaching are responding on some level, some more than others, and some with just maybe some level of interest. Like it's a sideshow at the circus. I want to go see what Jesus is going to do next. Maybe that's what they're saying. So they're going to see the miracles and the, a seed is being sown. Is it rocky soil where, boy, I am interested. I want to see what's happening. I want to go check it out. It's interesting stuff. It makes me feel good. But are their roots being sunk deep enough to withstand the difficulties of life? Then you see the, the Pharisees who twice show themselves to be more interested in judging Jesus and condemning him 
rather than listening to the message and responding positively. And so in chapter 12, we see him doing miracles and the Pharisees respond with, we need to kill him. That's a hard heart. That is seed sown on the path. And Jesus' response to that is to compare these religious leaders and their response with the dreaded, hated, evil Ninevites of the past. They responded, those evil, terrible people even responded, but you, the religious leaders of this nation, you don't respond. I think what Jesus is doing there is he knows this is the hard path, this is the hard road, and he's trying desperately uh, to come up with some drastic means of trying to plow that field, trying to sink the plow into the soil of their hearts and do something to loosen it up, and it just doesn't work. So now we're current with the book of Matthew, I believe. First four chapters, getting us to the point of preparation where the soil is ready to hear. Then the next eight chapters, the sowing of the seed in different kinds of soils, and we see that acted out as well. Chapter 13 we come to, and Jesus gives us the picture form of what has happened and how the kingdom in general all throughout history is going to expand. But I don't want to get too far down the road without making this applicable to us because we can't just brush this off as something Jesus talked to those disciples about and those people in ancient Israel about. He wants us to hear this message as well. Even if it's the 75th time, there's something for us to learn here. So I wanna ask you to examine the soil of your soul, the soil in your heart. Is it trampled down? Is it rocky? Is it distracted? Is it weedy and thistly? Are the worries of life too strong for you to grow in your faith? <clears throat> or are you fertile, ready soil to hear what God has to say, to hear the gospel preached and to be moved by it again? When you hear the word, <clears throat> excuse me, preached on Sunday morning or any other time, are you moved to try and make something out of it in your life? Does it change you in some way? Maybe you're a kind of person who's listening to this today and you've never heard about Jesus, that he died on a cross, that he shed his blood to take care of our sins, to pay the penalty for sin, that he was buried in a tomb but rose from the dead, guaranteeing that we would also rise someday and spend eternity in heaven with him. If you've never heard that before, I wanna beg you to respond to that today. Make sure the soil of your soul is open to listening and understanding that and respond. All right, so we've gone through the first two phases, soil preparation, seed planting. Now a crop is grown, a crop is produced. In the end, there's nothing we can do to make that crop grow. There's nothing we can do to make those seeds produce what we want it to produce. If I take uh, a seed and plant it because I want corn, if I plant a corn seed in the ground, I can prepare the soil so I can break it up, I can plow it, I can till it, I can make sure it's, it's broken up so the seed can go in there. I can bring those nutrients to the top. I can expose it to sun and rain I can take the weeds out of there. I could add fertilizer to it. But I can't make that seed do anything. It's left to God, who's programmed the DNA of that seed to produce a corn stalk, which will in turn produce an ear of corn. I can't make that happen. I can make the environment productive, but I can't make it happen. So we're always dependent on God to make the crop come. Now, I'm no expert. I see Jesus talking about a crop of 30 times, 60 times, 100 times being produced. And I wondered, is that how it works? Is, is that what's produced in a field? So I did um, what I needed to do since I'm no expert. I went online and looked at crop yields, which if you're having insomnia issues, I highly recommend this. Go check out crop yields for the last 10 years. What I found was that wheat in the last 10 years has produced about 42 times what goes in the ground. Plant a seed, 42 grains come out of the ground, plus the bales that come from those stalks. 
oats have a yield of about 24 times. Again, plus the, uh, the bales that come from those stocks. Corn. Corn is amazing. One seed of corn can produce over 800 kernels on the average ear of corn that comes out of the ground. 800. It's quite a yield. Common yields of 20 to 60 fold are the norm. And sometimes you get greater production than that. And this is the fertile soil, obviously the heart that's ready to hear the gospel, soil that's been prepared for that seed. I was thinking about some, uh, some kids that I've gone through youth group with and that I've seen as a part of youth ministries that I've been a part of. And I was thinking of a guy named Tom who uh, was a middle schooler, a junior higher, when I was a volunteer uh, way back at the beginning. And uh, for a couple of years, he was around and he was in small groups that I was a part of. He went on retreats that I was a part of and had a chance to do Bible studies with him and hear him talk about things and ask him questions and watch him research the Bible and search for truths in the word. He was a very intelligent guy. I mean, he could do anything. He's one of those guys that you'd say, this, this guy can do anything he wants. He was a good looking guy. He smiled a lot. He was just a happy guy. You figured there's no limits for him. Well, about the time he got done with high school, he decided he didn't want to be a Christian anymore. He chucked his faith. Instead of going to college and university and getting all those degrees, he ended up going to Alaska to work on some fishing boats. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We need people to do that. But he seemed to have this different destiny. I don't know if Tom ever came back to the Lord. I, I kind of think he was like that seed that was sown in the rocky soil and there was some quick early fruit that popped up out of the ground and it seemed like it was going to be a great crop in his life and at some point it just didn't have enough root i'm i'm going to pray that someday i'll see him in heaven and he'll tell the story of how he came back to his roots and how he came back to faith i think of another guy named mike who went through the youth group that i was a youth pastor of and uh, I would engage him in lots of conversation. I had him in middle school and high school all the way through. We had a good relationship. But he was one of those guys that was just always messing around. He never really got serious about spiritual things. He could get serious about sports and other things. But when it came time to spiritual things, he just got real quiet. Just didn't seem to engage. And I always thought he was like the seed that maybe fell um, on the hard path. Not that he was antagonistic or anything. It just nothing seemed to happen. Just didn't seem interested. Well, lost track of him uh, over the years. And uh, recently I, I kind of caught up to him uh, and found out that he went to college, went to seminary, became a pastor, and now he's pastoring at a thriving, growing church in Illinois where people are coming to know Christ because he is the senior pastor of that church. I liken him to Vicki Holsema's Azalea Bush, Remember at the end of the summer last year, we looked at this azalea bush at the front of their house and it would look like somebody had just come up and jammed a bunch of sticks in the ground and that was her bush. It looked dead, it looked unproductive, looked like maybe it should just get dug up and thrown away. Well, this spring, something amazing happened. Right at the beginning, it started having all these flowers and they were bright flowers and they were big flowers. It was overwhelming how big and bright these flowers were on this azalea bush. Something in the soil had to have changed to create that kind of crop, that fruit from that bush after we saw it at the end of the last year. And I think that must have happened with this guy, Mike. At some point, the, the soil of his soul, something happened, some fertilizer was, was introduced or some new environment was introduced to the soul, uh, the soil of his soul. And that seed took root and it began to burst forth and flower like that. Well, let's uh, make sure that we look at ourselves to finish off here. My last point is the soil of our hearts. We need to be careful with the soil of our hearts and make sure that we constantly go through soil care. Even us believers, us disciples, can become jaded and hard-hearted as we live life. We hear the gospel. We hear that presentation of what Jesus did for us so many times we become uh, immune to it. We hear it and we yawn. We forget how incredibly important that message is 
and what Jesus did for us. It's easy for us to react the way the, the Pharisees do and want to kill the messenger almost. I'm sure a lot of those Pharisees, when they got involved at the very beginning, their hearts were right. Their motivations and intentions were right on. They wanted to help people. But over time, all this worry over laws and keeping rules and making sure everybody else did the same thing, they switched to religion. Religion is death. Religious things are the path that's trampled down. It's relationship that's fresh and alive. We need to focus on that relationship and always remember what Jesus did. We need to guard against being Pharisees. Uh, especially those of us who are older. I think about the freshness of my faith when I was 17. All these years of ministry, seminary, studying the word, it's easy to get lost in that and forget about the relationship. So easy to get lost in the uh, theological truths and not the object of those truths. You know, in soil, uh, even a, a, a good field over time, being plowed and things growing over a course of years, rocks that are hidden way down deep will come to the surface. And every once in a while, a field that didn't used to have rocks will suddenly have rocks because they've surfaced over time. Those rocks need to be removed. Uh, weeds always creep into a field. It's easy for our lives to become weedy and thorny uh, if we allow the, the things of the world to weigh too heavily upon us. We have to guard against having rocks grow up in our souls and those thistles and weeds to grow up in our souls. Be distracted by things that we thought were gone from our lives. Maybe it's addictions, maybe it's other desires, maybe it's temptations that we thought we'd overcome. Those things come back. We need to always be on guard against those things and allow God to till the soil of our souls, to be ready, to be fresh, and to latch on to those truths when the word is preached. Let's ask the Spirit to be constantly vigilant in breaking up that soul and softening our hearts to the truths of the gospel. Spirit, I want to ask you to come today. Speak to all of us. Speak to me. I pray that you would prepare our soil every week that we come to hear Pastor Brad or somebody else preach. I pray that stories like this that we've heard so many times won't just be that same old story, but it will be fresh and new and there will be something for us to learn and to apply to our lives. I pray that we will grow in faith constantly and continually. Lord, continue to work in our souls. Continue to help us be more and more the disciples, the men, the women, the students that you have envisioned for us to be. We want to be worthy of you and your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen.